Hi, good evening, and thanks everybody for being here for this very important time, and I believe a very important event that is currently shaking our world. Uh, let me say that with us tonight is um, a colleague of mine, Kurt Maida, who's an attorney, um, and he is a scholar. Let me say that in the reason that I've asked Kurt uh, to speak tonight is not particularly because he is an expert in this area, but he does very careful research. And it's very difficult actually to find anybody who will, who will talk openly about the current situation in Ukraine. And Kurt always does. He's plain talking and he does his work. And so he is going to present what I think is a very different view that is being presented in the media, which is, as I said in the description, that this, all, this war is a product of the evil uh, man in Russia who is Vladimir Putin. Let, us, let me remind also our listeners or our viewers, and again, thank you for being with us tonight, that that man, Vladimir Putin, is the president of the Russian Federation. No matter how we uh, criticize him, or maybe even think that that election, he, and he was elected, is fraudulent. He was the, he is the elected leader of the Russian Federation. His name is Vladimir Putin, and he is a Russian person who, at least in his mind, is carrying out the foreign policy, his foreign policy, in the best interest of his Russian Federation. We probably disagree with that. However, that is really what is going on in my view. So calling him a madman or calling him a lunatic or calling him a dictator or calling him a despot doesn't get us very far. And that's why I wanted to have this meeting tonight to actually discuss the realities of what he is doing, what uh, we might disagree with, but nevertheless, what he is doing and the shape of the world that is emerging out of those events, those very tragic events in Ukraine. And please uh, also remember, another reason I think this event is so important is there's such vast censorship going on and propaganda going on in our media as well as probably in the Russian media, although we don't have a chance to look at the Russian media very much because Russia today has virtually been shut down, although I still get it for some reason. Russia Today is a publication from Russia. It's, it's akin maybe to BBC. So I've always been able to read Russia Today and see that there's another viewpoint. Isn't that interesting? But in our media, there is vast censorship. Today, I read a big article from, about, from Glenn Greenwald talking about how Tucker Carlson and also Tulsi Gabbard, a, a former presidential candidate, and a lieutenant colonel in the US Army were called treasonous uh, last night because of what they said on television, which was a mere review, as Gabbard said, of the fact admitted by our government that there are bio research labs in Ukraine. And for that, she has been labeled treasonous. So I'm attempting to get to the bottom of all this, very difficult, and I really thank Kurt for agreeing to talk about this topic and to maybe give a more cool-headed approach to what's going on in Ukraine. So go ahead, Kurt. Can we show that map though, Jenna? Is that all right, Kurt? Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna ask, show this map, which is quite blurry, why is that? Okay, there we go. All right, so, Anyway, Kurt, why don't, can you talk a little bit about what you think are the underlying reasons, perhaps, of this war in Ukraine? So, I mean, you know, one of the big issues that we need to focus on, if we're trying to understand why this is happening, is... Well, thank to, you for trying, right. ...is to learn a little bit about uh, what transpired at the end of the Soviet Union which uh, consisted of the country we know as Russia, as well as the Central Asian republics, the Baltic republics, and uh, what we uh, call now Ukraine, uh, that was always a part of the Russian empire, as well as the Soviet Union. Uh, in 1991, the Soviet Union essentially fell apart. There were a number of reasons for that. Uh, 
uh, partly due to uh, inefficiencies in the in the system, the economic system of the country, uh, partly due to the uptick in military spending that was brought on by the increase in military spending in our country. And then also uh, in part due to the, uh, the war uh, in Afghanistan that the yeah. Soviet Union was prosecuting and had spent about nine years there. Uh, I think we can, yeah, probably for different reasons, but I think we can identify with the difficulty and the expenses uh, in trying to nation build and occupy Afghanistan. The Soviets, despite the fact that they uh, shared a border with that country, uh, lost a lot of men and women and uh, lost a lot of, uh, of their resources, their economic resources in trying to occupy and run that country. By the way, uh, Kurt, that was sort of their Vietnam in a lot of ways, wasn't it? Yeah, that was sort of that was uh, sort of their Vietnam, except that uh, the luxury that the United States that we had was we had um, some very uh, financially, economically successful creditors, namely Japan and West Germany, that was that were both able to provide us extensive loans during our Vietnam War, our involvement in Vietnam. The Soviets did not have that luxury. Uh, they did not have any wealthy uh, countries in the Eastern Bloc that would come to its financial aid. So they took a financial beating. And then again, some of the other reasons I brought up, there were inefficiencies in their economic system and, uh, and they were spending a substantial amount of money uh, in defense costs to match the United States. Uh, and uh, that, was, that was their undoing. So uh our, our focus today of course is on the ukraine so what what happened the uh the, the different provinces or republics in the soviet union uh asserted their own independence well the, this was the, the collapse of the soviet union correct is you're talking correct about? and correct. that was in 91 right? that was in 1991 yeah right. uh oversaw by uh at that point the uh president mikhail gorbachev uh, in the uh, in the Soviet Union, and then transitioned government into Russia was uh, Boris Yeltsin, right? The first uh, the first premier of of a new Russian Republic, and the uh, the Commonwealth of Independent States, as Sandy mentioned before, the which was basically run by the Russian Federation in large part. Uh, so let's let's move forward to Ukraine. Uh, the Ukraine uh, also was one of the uh, Soviet republics that achieved independence in 1991. Uh, they signed a agreement to give up their nuclear weapons at that time. It was called the, uh, the Budapest Memorandum. The Budapest Memorandum basically uh, was a security guarantee that the new Russian Republic uh, would provide and it would essentially provide an assurance that it would not attack Ukraine. It would provide a, um, it would also recognize their territorial sovereignty in exchange for giving up their nuclear weapons. Uh, they had, the Soviet Union had nuclear weapons stationed throughout, you know, a, a very large, large country that spans 11 time zones. If you think of that, you know, we have three, if we don't include Hawaii, uh, in terms of the mainland, the, the Soviet Union had 11 time zones. So a massive country, and they had their nuclear weapons spread out throughout the country, which included the Ukraine at the time. Ukraine was the, uh, the westernmost portion of the Soviet Union. It, uh, it was in, in firmly within Eastern Europe, but it was the most western portion of the, of the Soviet Union. Uh, close to it bordered Poland and it does border Poland and uh, not too far from East Germany and West Germany. So the so Ukraine uh, gave up their nuclear weapons. They believed that they had uh, secured guarantees from the Soviet Union or I'm sorry, Russia at that point, that they would not be subject to an attack and that their territorial sovereignty would be respected at the time. Uh, what 
later transpired is the uh, was that the Ukraine had a great deal of interest in moving towards the West. There was an interest on their part in joining NATO. Uh, there was an interest on their part in joining the European Union. Of course, uh, both organizations have very stringent requirements uh, before they can join. There has to be a strategic, uh, uh, a certain level of uh, strategic necessity on the part of NATO. And, and when they deem a country as a possible potential member. And uh, at the in, uh, initially, they were not deemed a high level security uh, risk by, by NATO. I, we're seeing a map of Ukraine now. We can see uh, to the south of it, we're, we're, we see Moldova, we see Romania. To the, uh, to the west, we see Poland, Slovakia, and Hungary. And to the north, there's Belarus. And of course, uh, what we know now is Russia. Right. I interrupt you though, Kurt. So these are these these countries at the time. Poland has always been independent, correct? Uh, since the Second World War, yes. Since the Second World War, yeah. Belarus was part of Russia. And yeah, the Soviet no, it, Union. right, right. Belarus was a part of uh, the Soviet Union uh, at that time. You know, if you looked at Western maps, it was referred to as by Yellow Russia. Right. A uh, prominent city in that uh, country is Minsk. Right. Uh, so that, yes, to answer your question, that was part of- And Slovakia and Hungary during the um, Soviet period were also uh, independent, but really part of the Warsaw Pact and part of the Soviet Union in a lot of ways, correct? They were allies right, right. of the Soviet Union. Yeah, so the, I mean, they were independent countries, but they were part of the Warsaw Pact. Right. At that time, there was a Czechoslovakia, which right. then later, 1991, split into the Czech Republic and Slovakia. Uh, you know, and Hungary uh, has always been an independent country. Correct. So uh, the what what transpired after the early 1990s uh, was that Ukraine made movements towards gaining greater access to the West. Uh, even though initially the West wasn't really that interested, the West was more interested in, in the Baltic states. When I mean the West, I'm specifically talking about NATO and the European Union. Uh, they were more interested in, in the Baltic states as well as uh, countries like Hungary and Poland. Uh, so they were given a fast track towards uh, joining NATO. And initially, there was interest on the, believe it or not, there was interest on the part of the new, newly formed Russia uh, in joining NATO during the uh, early part of the Clinton administration. Uh, uh, Vladimir Putin himself was caught on camera speaking with President Clinton at the time about the prospect of Russia joining NATO. And uh, that was a part of uh, a conversation that took place amongst the elites in foreign policy, but then later that was, uh, that was obviously that was discarded. And the focus became acqui acquiring, I'm using the term acquiring in quotes, but acquiring countries that were formerly part of the, uh, of the, of the Warsaw Pact mm -hmm. uh, in the Soviet sphere and acquiring those countries and putting them into NATO. The difficulty- All, all except Russia though, Russia was never allowed to be in now even though they initially expressed interest uh there's a great documentary if anyone has showtime you know the uh it's a premium network that you pay for if there's a uh, if you have showtime there's uh there's a four-part interview between uh the american director oliver stone yes right. Vladimir putin uh highly recommend it if you if you have a chance to see that it's still on Showtime if you if you look on the uh, on the channel uh, on their website and it, it really gives you an idea you know I, I know Sandy started out the conversation with talking about uh, different pejoratives that have been used against Putin since the this uh, invasion of the Ukraine you know anything ranging from madman dictator and you know Sandy eloquently mentioned a couple of other uh, names that have been, right right but if you really want to get a chance to know you know, on, uh, you know, surfaced, of course, uh, a little bit, bit about uh, Vladimir Putin's values. 
I, I strongly recommend watching this uh, four-part documentary on Showtime. It, it, it talks a little bit about his security concerns. And it also had a clip of that famous tete-a-tete uh, uh, -tete with uh, President Clinton about the prospect of joining, joining NATO. And President Clinton at the time literally just, you know, waved him off and said, you know, that's part of a, a discussion for a different time and essentially silenced him during that conversation. Um, you know, it was a much very different Vladimir Putin than the one we know of today. Uh, you know, much more today's much, much more confident, much more uh, willing to go it alone. Uh, however, the other country that, you know, that expressed interest in joining NATO was Ukraine. What, what people don't really hear much about in our news today is the financial and economic situation and the situation with respect to corruption that has existed in the Ukraine since its, uh, its breakaway from the Soviet Union. The Ukraine is considered the poorest country in all of Europe. Right. You know, I know there's been a lot. I, I saw a few articles in our news over the last couple of weeks, uh, even you know, preceding the uh, Russian invasion and and subsequent to, stating that the that Russia was jealous that Ukraine was going to thrive once it you know joined the European Union. And I mean, if you look at the facts here, and again, I'm sticking with the facts. Um, the Ukraine is the poorest country in in all of Europe. Uh, they say the per capita GDP in, in, in Ukraine is lower than that of Botswana and uh, a couple of other uh, countries that are developing countries. Uh, Ukraine is also considered one of the most corrupt countries in the world. And I'm not talking about the, their moral, uh, you know, uh, about the, the, the morality of the people or of the leadership. I'm talking about just strictly, you know, the, uh, the day to day carrying on of the business of government, the level of corruption is extremely, extremely high. And that's really why, you know, if you ask, well, how come the European Union didn't admit Ukraine right from the get go, you know, as soon as Ukraine broke away? And how come NATO didn't take Ukraine in? Uh, in large part, you know, one of the challenges was the fact that the country is so poor. And, you know, NATO members actually have to pay a certain portion of their you know, a certain portion of their GDP goes towards um, military contributions and, and defense. And essentially, Ukraine has a great deal of, um, you know, a great deal of challenges in terms of actually making those kinds of payments. Uh, it, interesting, interesting note is uh, the biggest source of income, you know, I mean, you look at different countries and how they, you know, quote unquote, make their money. You know, uh, certain countries, you know, China, for example, is an incredible, incredible export market. Uh, the United States, export market, service industries. The largest source of revenue for Ukraine up until about a, a month ago was the fees that they charged Russian companies to operate gas lines through the country. They, they mm -hmm. earned uh, about an approximate uh, $3 billion a year, 3 billion US dollars a year. And essentially these are lease fees. These are you know, rent fees for pipes that go through the country. Uh, pipes that the Russians built and the destination of those pipes are eventually Western Europe. Uh, and that's the biggest source of income for the country. So uh, though the country has, you know, if, you, if you're thinking developing countries, you, you may not think of Ukraine, you think, you know, India, Bangladesh, you know, countries in Africa. Uh, however, you know, the, the, the Russian empire had, had built a great deal of infrastructure in the country. So it doesn't appear to be a country, a poor country like some of the other countries I just mentioned. However, that being said, in terms of uh, revenue, economy, manufacturing, very, 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 at a very primitive state. The country was largely agricultural. It was, you know, when the Soviet Union was around, it was at one point known as the breadbasket of, of, the, of the Soviet Union. Um, however, that being said, manufacturing, uh, the development of industry was, was at an extremely, extremely primitive level. So therefore the country didn't have the necessary funds that typical countries that join the European Union have, have access to, and even to make contributions toward defense 
like members of NATO uh, have to make according to the, uh, the, the NATO treaty amongst member states. So as a result, the Ukraine uh, had, has not become a member of NATO. And one of the benefits for countries that are members of NATO is that there's a common defense clause where essentially an attack on a member state is deemed an attack on all states that are members. Right. Uh, so it's important for us, you know, as we get caught up in, in, the, in the visual imagery that we watch on television these days and internet, that, uh, that the United States, as well as other NATO countries, the reason we're not sending, or we have not yet sent, uh, you know, F-16s or F-35s to, uh, to Ukraine and heavy armaments is because technically we don't have an obligation to do so. Our obligation, if you, you know, want to consider that, is towards other NATO member states, and, and essentially Ukraine is not a member state. And can I, can I interrupt with you for just a second? Yeah. So, but there isn't, there's another reason. First of all, I, I'm not certain that Vladimir Putin would have ever been allowed into NATO because NATO was formed as an alliance against Russia and the Soviet Union. And that Correct. was in 1947. So I don't quite, I mean, I understand that people would have blown him off, I think wrongfully, frankly. However, the alliance itself is anti-Russian, isn't it? Well, certainly. I mean, in terms of why the alliance was formed, Sandy, I mean, you're, you're 100% right. It was to essentially offset the Soviet Union uh, from a military standpoint. Right. However, you know, many people that in the foreign policy uh, ranks in the 1990s started to see NATO as potentially having, you know, more of a almost like a an armed uh, 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 element of the of the United Nations role as a peacekeeping uh, 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 instrument. The, you know, there were there were there were talks in the early 2000s, specifically after the September 11th attacks, that the role of NATO, rather than being a counterbalance to the Soviet Union, should be perhaps you know an anti-terrorist right right uh, well, instrument, that's what, that's what including Putin want, with, right? yeah with cooperation with right. Russia right uh, you know because Russia has uh, been you know if we want to specifically talk about Middle Eastern or Islamic terrorism. You know, Russia has been subject to it, as has Western right. Europe and the United States. And uh, and, you know, so th there was a there was a common bond there, uh, specifically during the early portion of the 90s, when Russia was prosecuting a war against uh, the Republic Chechnya. of Chechnya. Chechnya. Which, but Chechnya um, was a part of Russia also. It was never and still is not an independent republic. That so, is correct. Right. So when Russia says we are defending ourselves in Chechnya against terrorism, yeah, it's, it's, it's the same thing as the United States would say about, for instance, a country, or North Carolina or something like that being what the United States would define as a terrorist bunch. Chechnya is a part of Russia at this point. You are. But there were, right, there were elements, and, you know, I don't want right. to uh, go off on a tangent regarding Chechnya, but, they, yeah, there were, yeah. You know, were strong links with al-Qaeda, and many of the, uh, right. you know, many, and I'm using the term lightly, but many of the irritants that, you know, we had to deal with as well as, uh, you know, other countries in Western Europe and around the world had to deal with, with that, okay. you know, terrorist okay. organization. So, but, but as there was an agreement, I believe too early on, Kurt, wasn't there that when Germany, when there was a question of Germany being reunited, wasn't there kind of a deal between at that point, the Clinton administration? No, the Bush administration. It was Bush the George H.W. Bush, right, senior Bush. Bush. And at that point, Gorbachev to uh, th that Germany would be reunited, but that NATO would never be expanded to the borders of Russia. Right? That's correct. Actually, that NATO would not expand past what was right. once East East Germany. Right, right. It would not go past that, but that quickly, uh, you know, that that yeah, that that did not take place. Uh, that NATO did, in fact, quickly expand into the Baltics and uh, into Central Europe and portions of Southern Europe, even. Okay, so. Uh, so so the, maybe the, we could fast forward then to more of the present. 
um, NATO did expand, correct? It took in it, places like Poland. It took in yes. 22, I think, countries, right. all of whom were on the border of Russia, correct? Pretty much. Uh, that, yeah, yes, that's correct. And then wasn't there still an understanding that Ukraine would not join NATO? Wasn't that sort of still an understanding, particularly from the German point of view and the French point of view? From the standpoint of the reunific reunification of Germany, that yeah. was something that was specifically discussed. Uh, okay. you know, but again, it was quickly, quickly discarded in terms of policy. As you mentioned, there were several other countries that uh, that were quickly admitted into NATO. It's also important to note at that point that Russia, you know, regardless, again, we're trying to stay away from different pejoratives and insults, but Russia was an absolute disaster in the 1990s. Right. Uh, the levels of unemployment, uh, the, uh, the involvement of different mafia groups, organized crime groups that were running the country was, it, it was abominable, honestly. And they, at that point, you know, if you think about, you know, the, the war in Iraq, uh, sanctions against Iraq, the Russians were not in a position to do anything to offset any, anything that NATO or the United States was doing militarily around the world. So I'm, I'm sure they would have probably made a bigger stink at the UN about the admission of these additional countries into NATO. However, they simply did not have the financial capital and the wherewithal to lay out any major, major objections. Certainly not the type that they have, you know, they're in a better position to do so now when Ukraine in the last few, in, in the last five to 10 years has been looked at as a potential prospect for joining NATO. Okay, so what happened then um, about, in the present, what happened um, about Ukraine? Or what what was what happened exactly to, in your view, to cause this present confrontation, this military, uh, more than an incursion, certainly an invasion from Russia into Ukraine? What was the immediate cause? Right. So again, it's something that you know we're not unfortunately hearing about in the press, and it's not, you know, and I, I'm not sure, you know, if it's just because. Uh, you know, they usually say, you know, when wars start, you know, the facts go out the window from all sides. Uh, and I think, you know, unfortunately, we're, you know, we're in that boat right now, because our country has a very strong position with regard to what's transpiring right now in Eastern Europe. Uh, but one of the things to note was in 2021, there was a, uh, a NATO military exercise that was, you know, so just moving past that, you know, we talk about how, why did, uh, why did 200,000 Russian troops amass uh, along the border of Ukraine and Russia? So let's, so let's, let's quickly just go into that. Uh, in 2021, there was a joint military exercise amongst a number of the NATO states, including a guest member, not, I'm sorry, I shouldn't call them a member, a guest, namely the Ukraine, in participating in these uh, military exercises, it was called Defender 21. The Defender 21 was one of the largest joint military exercises in the continent of Europe since the Second World, since the end of the Second World War. Uh, and the objective of this joint military exercise was to, you know, not start a hot war, but to imagine a potential war against Russia. And uh, that was uh, that was taking place in the spring of 2021. Uh, the Russians, Vladimir Putin, uh, voiced their objections to the objective of this military exercise, as well as the fact that it was taking place. And seven of I think over 20 different exercises, military exercises. Seven of them were going to take place actually in the Ukraine itself to uh, basically recreate, you know, imaginary, of course, but recreate a potential invasion on the part of Russia uh, uh, against against Eastern Europe. Uh, the United States also sent a significant naval fleet into the Black Sea 
So these were pretty, pretty uh, notable large scale military exercises that had commenced in, in the spring of 2021. Uh, and that was essentially, you know, either for good reasons or bad reasons, Vladimir, Vladimir Putin's justification for amassing troops against uh, along the uh, along the border with Ukraine. Okay. There also weren't there kind of maybe loose uh, lips in a way from the Biden administration that they wanted Ukraine into NATO. Isn't that correct? That's from, yeah, there's conjecture from, from Vice President Harris and from also President Biden. And that was pretty early on in their administration, right? That's correct. There there were rumors and rumors going around that, you know, th there was a potential, uh, you know, admission process that would be initiated for Ukraine, which, uh, which the Russians have always claimed was going to be a red line for them. P particularly President Putin has said that's their red line. Correct. Right? That's correct. Okay, so I don't know if there was an immediate trigger to the invasion, but that's, is that in your view, what happened? First of all, I believe, wasn't there kind of a change to in foreign policy toward Russia, toward Russia? President Trump appeared to want to do business with Russia, correct? Uh, I believe, yeah, there, I, I, think, uh, I think the Russians, however, would probably, uh, challenge that notion, uh, they would probably say that regardless of some of the rhetoric that uh, our prior administration expressed openly in, uh, in foreign policy circles, uh, there, the prior administration continued yeah. with administ administrations prior to them in terms of uh, enacting and establishing sanctions regimes against Russia. Uh, so Russia would claim that they did not get any break from the prior administration with respect to different types of sanctions that were implemented against it. So maybe the, the maybe the the rhetoric rhetoric was a little more flowery. However, the reality on the ground uh, in terms of uh, uh, economic sanctions being leveled against Russia was continuous. Yes, right, and that was true from President Trump's mouth, also correct. I mean, he would say often that his policy toward Russia was he wanted to do business with Russia. He had, I think, another aim, and that was to keep Russia close and not in the arms of China. I think that he also enunciated that policy at times. But underlying the rhetoric, as you say, the continuation of a real, war, as Putin would say, war against Russia continued. In, in, the in economic is, one. What? The economic in, 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 one. The economic right. one. So then when Biden's elected, Biden basically continued this war essentially against Russia, I, I would have to say, right? Yeah. So, I mean, it's you know, important to note, I mean, you know, the NATO exercise that I referred to, uh, Defender 21, that took place uh, in spring of last year, you know, the, this wasn't a couple of people, you know, sitting at a card table that, you know, just decided to throw this together. The, 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 uh, exercise that took place in March was, you know, you kind of look at like the, the you know, the, uh, the Bay of Pigs invasion. It started from the previous administration. Uh, you know, they, they get together and especially the scale of this military exercise was so great that uh, it, there, it was months and months in the planning. Uh, not something, you know, that was impromptu thrown mm -hmm. together. So, you know, you, you can talk about, uh, presidential policies that are enunciated. And then you can talk about policy that emanates from the Pentagon. Right, uh, of course. You know, yeah. a, a, different, a different thing and, and appears to be a little more continuous and not subject to the four-year election cycles that, you know, that other parts of our government are, are subject to, or two years if we're talking about, you know, Congress or six or senators. So I think what you're saying, Kurt, then is this war is kind of a, the the United States does not have particularly clean hands. Put it that way. That's a, that's a legal notion. But the United States does not approach this, nor does NATO, with clean hands. Yeah, I mean, look at immediately prior to the uh, to the uh, invasion on Russia's part, uh, notable uh, uh, journalists 
you know, names, I think that, uh, you know, a number, most, most, you know, people that are pretty familiar with, with uh, foreign policy events would, would, would be, uh, you know, familiar with names like Tom Friedman at the New York Times, uh, articles in the, the magazine, The Atlantic, The Nation, uh, other, other places mentioned the fact that, you know, uh, we were kind of, you know, needling Russia and kind of, you know, poking uh, it, poking the Russian bear. Yeah, yeah, poking the Russian bear with this whole notion of the expansion of NATO. Uh, and that that was something that they were, you know, maybe for good reasons or bad reasons, you know, very sensitive about, uh, you know, not too differently from, you know, in the event, let's say, uh, if, if China or, or if Russia, in this case, were to develop, you know, deep um, alliances with Mexico or, or, or Canada, two countries that, right. you know, are at, at our border, uh, and uh, the Russians similarly had a, a specific sensitivity towards, uh, you know, the Baltic states, towards Ukraine and countries that were in their quote unquote sphere of influence. Uh, in so, backyard. You know, in their backyard, yeah. I mean, you know, we, uh, for better or worse, we have something that, you know, foreign policy elites in, in our country seem to refer to even 200, 200 years after the fact, something known as the Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe the, Doctrine, the right. Rus yeah, the Russians, the Russians had the Brezhnev Doctrine. The Brezhnev Doctrine didn't look too differently than the Monroe Doctrine, except, you know, it was, uh, it pertained to that part of the world. Now, again, uh, you know, I, I want to, you know, just, you know, uh, say, you know, from in, in terms of my own points of view about this, you know, I, 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 I condemn any use of force by any nation against another nation. And I don't believe in the term collateral damage. Uh, you know, no innocent should, you know, whether it's whether it's in Iraq, Afghanistan, or Ukraine, I, I don't believe any any, you know, innocent life should be harmed or, 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 you know, loss or uh, in the process of, you know, any of these power politics by powerful countries. Uh, so, you know, I mean, what, it, you know, in terms of things that are happening on the ground, you know, these are atrocities that, you know, a civilian population are facing right. and it's unfair, you know, and, you know, I don't think Sandy or I, you know, belittle those things, but, you know, but we also want to provide some perspective uh, independent of some of the, you know, the emotional images we see on television as to what is happening and why it's happening. All right. But there's another reason that I feel so strongly about this. We are Americans and we should be watching out for the foreign policy of our country. And I believe that the foreign policy of our country is really, um, is, you know, is causing these kinds of wars all over the world, essentially. And the world is not happy about it. And Russia and I think, as you do, that Russia committed the essential sin of war by invading Ukraine and causing all these damages. But I still think that the United States has to have a more responsible foreign policy. And that's why I'm here tonight. We cannot continue to act in this fashion of basically being at war with Russia, even though it's kind of a covert war. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, you mentioned the, you know, the reuni reunification of Germany right. during the, the, the course of the uh, George H.W. Bush administration. Right. And uh, the fact that, you know, uh, there were talks specifically providing assurances to the Russians at that point that NATO wouldn't expand. You know, there, and there were, there were also talks, uh, I mean, a lot of uh, conversations at the highest levels of foreign policy in the United States outside of the, the German reunification plan, stating that, you know, perhaps, you know, NATO should be dissolved at that point, yes, or at right, the very least, right. you know, its function should be, uh, should, should be altered, and that it should not be expanded. Uh, so, I mean, you know, this was, this did play a part in, um, in you know, as you said, you know, poking the Russian bear. Uh, and, you know, it was poked and poked and poked. Uh, and again, I'm, I, you know, again, my personal view here is, um, you know, it's I, I was not expecting this invasion I to I wasn't go past the uh, the right. you know, the Luhansk and, uh, you know, the eastern areas of Ukraine where there are Russian majorities. I think 
you know, Mr. Putin is probably going to be, um, you know, um, disappointed uh, and learning, you know, from the, our own example that it's going to be difficult in, you know, in the modern age to occupy uh, a, a hostile nation, as we learned in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, the, 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 the peace is going to be more difficult than, I think, the battles for, for Russia. Okay, um, before uh, anybody have any, I think we should maybe stop. I want to mention one other uh, fact, though, that is missing in the current debate. And that is in 2014, NATO, I mean, um, Ukraine had a president that was pro-Russian, correct? And in right. 2014, there were huge protests in the Maidan Square, fueled admittedly even by the United States um, by Victoria Newland, who was the ambassador at that time to Ukraine. As a result of those protests that were some, of course, honest protesters against that Russian president, pro-Russian president, some that were kind of a color revolution, so-called, of uh, protesters that were, uh, that were funded a lot and also encouraged by the United States, that pro-Russian president left Ukraine and a government that was more friendly to the United States came into power. And that government also that's currently under the uh, aegis of President Zelensky began more and more to turn toward NATO, toward Europe, toward the United States, and that kind of policy did continue. So, but the other thing that I want to mention is that it is the Ukrainian people that are suffering from this superpower collision, and it will be in the end. It will, they are, and that is simply tragic. No one deserves it. Yeah, but, I mean, look, I mean, whether, whether we're talking about Cubans or we're talking about Ukrainians, you know, I mean, I do believe that a nation has a fundamental right to go in the direction that it wants to go. You mm -hmm. know, so if the Ukrainians are interested in, you know, becoming more Western oriented, they should have that choice. I believe that. However, the reality, unfortunately, in a world of power politics is that, you know, the big countries will not allow that to happen. You know, whether it's, you know, the, the Cubans wanting to, um, pursue a socialist system 90 miles from Florida, or the Ukrainians wanting to lean towards the West, uh, you know, the, the superpowers, and I do still consider Russia a superpower, you know, they have their spheres of influence. And unfortunately, like you said, in this case, you know, the Ukrainian people are gonna suffer. And so, any battle, if this war continues, yeah. They are going to be totally obliterated, it seems to me, because if NATO makes one false move or if the United States makes one escalatory move, including um, troops, including a no-fly zone, it's the Ukraine co countryside, it's the Ukraine people who are going to be destroyed, it seems to me. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's important to remember, you know, the, the distinction between Iraq and Afghanistan and Ukraine is that, you know, when we got involved in those two wars, uh, we don't share a border with those countries. Yeah, right. Yeah, you know, you know, Russia is a large, large country and it shares a, a fairly large border and they can just pour troops, tanks, everything can essentially just pour into that country. It's pretty flat uh, too, it's flat. And it's flat largely, yeah. yeah. Okay, I wanted to uh, uh, ask if there are any questions or any thoughts before I turn to another I want to ask, what is what is the, the new world order that seems to be emerging from uh, this war? Because I believe that that is also the case, that there's, this is a major change, no matter what happens. Well, it's, it, it, Are there any other questions or, or comments? Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, can I then just mention something that I, that, hit me like a flash because of actually because of my colleague Eric Anyero who's with us on a different computer tonight. There Eric, was a question. Go there ahead. Was a question from Sanford. Oh I didn't see it. Is there a question from Sandy? The other Sandy, Sanford. Where is it in the chat or something? Does anybody see it? 
I don't see anything in the chat, Sandy. And okay. Stanford, you're muted. Yeah, they may have raised their hand. Hey, Sandy, take your, get off mute. I'm not, oh, the other Sanford. Sandy. Sanford, I yeah, call him Sanford. Sanford. Yeah. I want to make a point, if I could, about uh, Putin and Biden leading up to this invasion by Russia. Putin was telling Biden, as the Russians have been telling the West for a long time, that they shouldn't move west, east. If they did, it would be an existential threat to the continuation of the Russian country. And George Keenan, a policy advisor at the State Department in 1948, back then said it would be a strategic mm -hmm. error to move mm -hmm. east, and that Russia eventually, if that was done, would react to it. Right. And George Bush told Gorbachev, when Gorbachev said, don't move east, promise, not one inch. But we slowly, slowly kept moving in there. We have armed all those countries. Right. We right. have nuclear-capable weapons, missiles on Russia's borders. They certainly are in a bad defensive position at this point. Putin, when Biden was talking about NATO, said that was a red line and not to do it. And Putin said, look, we need a treaty. Security for Russia, security for the Eastern Republic, security for the West, and he even presented one. And it's a pretty reasonable treaty. And uh, it did provide that NATO would not move East. And Biden's response was, NATO will decide what countries it will admit, not some other country. Well, you know, every treaty inhibits people, countries from doing certain acts and they get mm -hmm. something in return for that. So mm -hmm. it's a non-starter to say what Biden said. Right. And that set up the battle here. Right. Putin even said, I will take direct action if we can't get a defensive treaty. We feel threatened. And you heard how Biden responded. And I think Biden responded that way, hoping, or even hoping, provoking, okay. hoping or provoking the attack so that he could be in the position he's in today and trying to destroy Russia. Why? Yes. It didn't make sense not to give a treaty yeah. or even if, if you, what's wrong with talking about a treaty for common defense? Right. He, he wouldn't do it. And he knew what the result would be. He wanted it. He wanted it. And he wow. thinks he's going to destroy Russia. And I mean, wow. it's important, Sanford, I mean, it's important to remember, I mean, you know, Biden, you know, is, was, is and was an old cold warrior. Right. Yeah, you know, he's a pro he's a product of that age. You know, he's not yes. Obama. He's not other people that have you know a different necessarily a a a different point of view. He's from yes. that generation where you know where you know he was in he was, you know he was in the midst of the Cold War when he cut his teeth politically. Interestingly, when he was a senator, he said we should never make the mistake and move east against Russia. But he uh, did. Biden said that. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions or thoughts? There is another uh, subject I'd like to sort of ask. I see Sally ro okay, raised her Sally, hand. Sally. Sally. Yeah. You you might have touched on this when I had to duck out. So tell me if you've already discussed it. But I I I think that um, the fact that that Putin's uh, bombing. Uh, apartment buildings and hospitals is is m making really all the rest of the world see him as a complete monster. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't. But what what how is he able to justify attacking well, Sally, civ civilians in brutally uh, and and 
think that he can get away with that. Well, he obviously is getting away with it, but. I don't know if he would offer, I don't think, there's two levels of propaganda. He, he, the Russians have denied it. Are they right? Are they, are the US right? US is saying that that's happening. The Russians are saying it's not happening. There's prop, there's incredible propaganda. Well, All right, if, if, if you believe that, that they, he's doing that, you're right. But I want I to- I don't believe the photo photographs are fabricated. No, I know that, I know. However, that's what I'm talking about, that I don't know the answers to that. But I do know a second answer to your question, which is the world sees him as a monster. And that's what I wanted to end this with, because that is not true. Eric, well, it's, a, as, it's, 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 a, it's becoming true. Well, Eric well, Aniero I mean, is the person that I was going to just address. He was just in Africa. And what the final part of this program is given to the new world that's um, that's emerging which i think is emerging and that is that most of the people of the world do not see putin as a monster in fact when he came back from africa eric and he's right here in the room he can address this to himself he saw putin pro putin posters all over the place and that that's was, true that was oh, that's that was. also true in the in latin america and well, that's that's great, but that's no, not no, how he's just that's not how he's been behaving in the last couple of weeks. I okay. mean, so that's, can I, that can was I, the I, last couple of weeks. Anyway, go ahead, Kurt. Can I just jump in? Yeah. I, I mean, I I think you know I I believe the images, Sally, with you as far as hospitals and apartment buildings. I, I think one one of the things it illustrates is the fact that you know we think we're in this. Uh, and Sanford can probably jump in on this one also. We think we're in this era of smart warfare, mm -hmm. where you know uh, when you have planes flying over and they, and they hit strategic targets, uh, that that doesn't isn't necessarily the case. There's you know when when you're bombing targets that are in cities, whether those cities are Kiev or Baghdad uh, or Mosul, you're going to have uh casualties that are civilian and again i don't believe in the term collateral damage i consider right. you know any of that uh you know a war crime honestly uh however i you know i'm going to apply the same standard in iraq too in afghanistan you know there were hospital maternity hospitals uh children's hospitals that were hit in those countries by u.s bombs you know and they didn't get the same coverage maybe they got coverage in russia showing what we were doing there but uh, no, I don't. I don't give. Uh, I don't give President Putin a pass on that. No, but nobody does. But I wanted yeah. to say something else, and that's the point I'm making. There seems to be a new set of alliances emerging out of that. Many people in the third world see the NATO powers as monsters. But Sandy, so is it is it really is what? it really is it really new or is it just going back to the pre-1991 yes that's what it looks like to me what i see is something that is not being touched on by any of the american media when they talk about the world turning against putin i think we have to say that for instance the BRICS countries aren't turning against putin the BRICS countries that is brazil russia india south africa China, they are forming, I think, a new alliance that has many people who feel the same way. They're sick of also Western, European, and the US imperialism themselves. And so yeah. they are not necessarily seeing Putin in the same way as Sally does, or as that we do. And that to me is really uh, what is emerging from this whole war. The world, those are the BRICS leaders. China, Xi Jinping, Vladimir Putin, Bolsonaro, I don't know, Modi, I guess, right, in uh, Kurt in India, yeah. and South Africa. These people are forming a new alliance that is very, I mean, I don't think it's a good, it's good news. But what, but it, what it, 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 you know, but Sam, I don't think it, any it, of this is good news. It doesn't, look, it doesn't look any different from the alliances that were around 
you know, in the 1960s and 70s. No, but they're much more firm now. And, and one of the reasons is, is that this administration and all of our administrations have pushed Russia into the arms of China. That's really Can I happened. interject here? Yeah, Sandy. I want to interject quickly about killing civilians and then on the new world order. Civilians are illegal targets, but practically speaking, they are intended to be killed in big numbers to break the will of a country. You want to talk about killing civilians, think of Madeleine Albright. U.S. inspired sanctions killed half a billion Iraqi children under the age of five. And Leslie Stahl asked Madeleine Albright, our Secretary of State, on TV if she could comment on that. And she said, and this is addressing civilians, and these are babies, we think the price is worth it. Yep. We killed probably since the end of World War II up to 15 million people, most of them civilians. We, the United States government. Okay. That's my spiel on that. They're legitimate targets in the minds of warring parties to break the spirits of the country so they lose. As far as what's happening now, I think one of the important things is Pepe Escobar, who writes for the Asian Times, is a sophisticated economist, and he is saying that the sanctions have a large and important role to bringing down even the United States, yes, who has sir. a precarious right, economy right. right now. Right, correct. So there are some big changes. You don't even have to talk about the other parties that are forming up against the United States. And West the SWIFT and system, right. you know about the SWIFT system. Yes. It's, yes. A, it's a method of changing money from one party to another. It's done in dollars now. People are breaking away from that. Right. And all trade has to be in dollars. Our dollar is in great demand. Right. And that has kept our dollar valuable. Countries are pulling away from that. Right. India, China, Russia, they're going to have an alternate system. That's going to hurt the United States. Big time. Big time. Yeah, big time. The United States is in big trouble. And unfortunately, I hope the world treats us better than we treated it. Well, one of the things, too, that I heard today, geez, I heard that Saudi Arabia is going to begin to change their sales to uh, to Chinese currency. I don't even know what it's called, yuan or something like that. They're, and they wouldn't, and the president of the United States tried to call them about this, and he didn't pick up the call to President mm -hmm. Biden. How can, I mean, this is happening on our watch. It's, anyway, what I wanted to really think think about, have people think about, was not only the current war, but what is coming up? What does this new world look like? And maybe it's too soon to tell, but I don't, I think that the world is going to split into two major confrontational um, alliances with most of the people in the BRICS nations. That's where the population is, right? Anyway, Eric, did you want to comment on something? Okay, I'm going to, Eric Onyero wants to say something. I don't know how to do that, Eric. Hello? Okay. Did you? No, it's not. Yeah, but it's but it's uh, we have the echo, which is all right. What I wanted to say is uh, probably uh, Kurt said that it's the alliance that was prior to uh, the dismantling of uh, the you know the Eastern Bloc, but this time you don't have two major blocks. You have uh, mid-size. Uh, powers like Turkey, like Brazil, like India that are coming up. So it's no longer the confrontation between the Soviet Union and the West. It's like a multipole 
uh, you know, geo geo strategic move that will make it very difficult for the West to sustain. Second of all, you, the US and Europe are done when it comes to uh, opportunity for growth. It's now the new emerging countries, it's Africa, it's probably Asia. So uh, 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 the West will become a, a block of countries like Switzerland. Everybody has maybe some, uh, some uh, thing to eat, nice roads, nice cars, but there won't be no dynamic. So uh, today, the Africans have understood that, that the big superpowers like the US and Europe have no more teeth. And even if they have um, atomic and nuclear teeth, they won't be able to use it. China can use it. Russia can use it. Uh, a lot of countries are coming up to be also uh, a nuclear powers. So they feel that there's a, there's a niche here, there's an opportunity here to uh, not being seen no more as uh, countries where the, uh, the superpowers can come and dictate the laws, but they will now start to, to ask who's the best offer. And then that's what is happening in Mali. The Malian for the first time got rid of the French ambassadors. And the problem of the European powers with the West is that what is their credibility today to, right. to, to talk about what, China, what uh, uh, Russia is doing when they're doing the same thing elsewhere? France is still dominating 15 African countries, you know, uh, uh, like with the blessings of the US. Uh, 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 these colonial powers are in the desert over there. They made the, uh, a mess out of Libya. And today, right. how can they have credibility to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to tell people that uh, Russia is doing wrong. So it's a, it's a new, it's a new uh, world that is coming there. And, 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 and uh, uh, we have, I mean, the US and Europe have to come down from the pedestal. An empire or a big, I mean, I don't know, but anything has an end. The rest of the world wants to be just lackeys to, you know, get you know, orders from, uh, from the U.S. At some point, China will become bigger. At some point, India will grow. And then, I mean, uh, I don't know. I don't see like billions of people like Indians wanting to be lackeys anymore. This is our okay. end. Okay, I don't know where that Muted, I guess. Sandy, you're muted. Can't okay, there I go. Okay, so um, I think we're running out of time. Is there any further questions? I think that, that, that my mind got really almost transformed about this whole subject when Eric came back from Africa. And when he mentioned that why would Africans trust the old imperial powers like France, England, and the United States. Why would Latin America condemn Russia and favor its old imperial power, the United States? It doesn't make any sense. So therefore, the brown, the black world doesn't seem with us anymore. And I think that is really a significant change that we're going to have to face in some way. And I believe what you said, Sandy, about this currency question, the US dollar is losing its value, right? Yes, I think so. I mean, why would a country like Cuba, for instance, condemn Russia? Why? They wouldn't. Why? And why they, would we not, condemn they would not condemn Russia. Russia has always bailed them out in a lot of ways and protected them from the United States. In other words, we really have to rethink and, and as Eric said the other day, the Western Europeans had better get a little humility in all this, right? It yeah, seems. I think it may be too late for the United States and Europe to rethink anything. I want to just You be might be right, aside. which is a sad statement because still with all of that, the United States, in my mind, has had a constitution, has had a whole uh, understanding of the rule of law that I still very much value and I, you're, I mean, as you said, I'm, I'm hoping it's not too late. 
I'm really Can I respond to that statement? Yeah. Sure. Sure. You know, everyone likes to talk about those things, democracy in the United States and everything. We may have political rights on the Constitution, but we have no economic rights at all right. for the masses. And what happens here is the elites make the decisions and the weak have to accept them. And the best examples are the 2008 crash and... Uh, well, the, how about 1929? Well, uh, oh, the 2008 crash and sending all the jobs overseas. Right, right. The American people, if they had a say, would not have sent the jobs overseas. The rich were making enough money here, but they wanted more. They're greedy, so they send the jobs overseas. 2008 crash, all about profits. There, everybody, there were so many crooks, and none of them went to jail. None of them. Other countries, some went to jail. And what about the, compare that with the, the average person, the majority of us to think about a democracy. They lost their jobs. They lost their cars. They lost their houses. They lost their health care. They lost the savings they had to send kids to college. They started living in cars. They started taking drugs and dying from overdoses. Uh, it was a mess. So, so these economic rights, we don't have a say, and we don't ha we lose. If we had a say, that wouldn't happen. So there is no democracy in this country. It's an oligarchy. You talk about law, you rob a gasoline station, you're going to job, jail. You destroy the world's economy in 2008, and not a goddamn thing happens to you. So don't talk to Sandy Kelson about the rule of fucking law, because there is the rule of power in this. But country. Sandy, you're a lawyer, right? I know I'm a lawyer, so I know what I'm talking about. I know, I know what the law is. I know. And I'll tell yeah. you, Go if ahead. anybody wants to really look at this in a, a unique way, those issues, read the book, or Enemies in Blue. In what? Blue. Our enemies in blue. You'll get the gist of it. They're there for like when all these people are homeless all of a sudden to make sure they stay in their place. Read that book. Okay, Sandy, can I mention that um, you're that you're a veteran of Vietnam? No, I'm not a veteran of Vietnam. I was in during that era. Oh, okay. I was in Alaska in 1965. I was put on orders to go to Vietnam, where a whole unit was leaving in the middle of January, 66. I got called down to talk to the captain. He said, Sandy, you're three-year tour of duty. You have less than 90 days. If you had 90 days or more, I could make you go to Vietnam for a year. I can't. So I have your re-enlistment paper. I said, no way. And I didn't go. And wow. uh, I started getting letters from my friends there, and they said, everybody here hates us. And I was a naive kid. I wouldn't talk the way you hear me talking back then. I would be talking about the rule of law and democracy back then. And they said to me, everybody here hates us. And that made no sense to me, because we were the good guys, they were the bad guys, and we're helping people. And it made me, maybe for the first time in my life, do a little critical thinking. I went to the library. And I read everything I could about Vietnam, the French and everything. And I don't want to take that much time, but my conclusion was that we weren't there to stop the forced imposition of communism on a country that didn't want it. We were there to impose a form of government on them they didn't want. Right. And my bodies died and got tortured and lost limbs for lives. You don't have a democracy when your government can send you overseas to kill or be killed for lies and that's known and proven and nobody is held accountable. The elite, our rulers, are not held accountable. There is no equal laws in this country. On the books, in black and white, yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Anyway, thank you all. This is a topic that will not be over soon. So thank you all for being with us. Thank, thank you. you all. Thanks, Sandy. Nice to see you again.
Bye. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Kurt.